Welcome everybody here in the room and all those fans of uh, research on Eastern Europe online. Um, we are happy to have you with us on this occasion of the reopening of our Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area here in Leipzig. Reopening means we are happy that we are going into a second phase that this campus works. Um, whoever is curious about this campus is invited to visit our website, of course. Just two sentences. Um, we are a network of research institutions, three universities in Central Europe, six further non-university research institutes that have decided together to promote young researchers who want to do research on Eastern Europe, who want to become experts on Eastern Europe on their way to um, established academicians and so on. Um, and by that um, we are uh, happy that we are not only working together um, among these institutions here, but normally we would have had a regional conference of BASIS, which Matthias Naumann, uh, Neumann, sorry, now is going to introduce okay. us with a short sentence. Yeah, very, very, very briefly. It's a real pleasure to be here in Leipzig today, and I'm really excited about the collaboration with the Leibniz Science Campus, uh, Zeus Berlin, as well as the DG Owen, putting together uh, the regional conference under the theme of Eastern Europe, uh, globalizing Eastern Europe. Uh, it was supposed, of course, to take place right now in, in, in Leipzig, and unfortunately, as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic, we had to postpone it to April next year. And I just want to say, you know, keep uh, out for announcement and messages from us about uh, the conference in due course, uh, when we will announce how exactly the conference will take place and the circumstances we find ourselves in. And for now, I just want to welcome everyone to tonight's uh, event, which will explore the impact of the pandemic uh, on research in our field. Stay tuned. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gemma Poutsken. I'm the moderator this evening, a journalist uh, from Berlin. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, also, if we have audience in the room and we have audience somewhere in the world, in the internet, I heard that there are even some people from India watching us, so welcome everybody. And uh, we will talk tonight about research under COVID-19 conditions, Eastern Europe as a global area. And um, I think uh, that COVID-19 actually acted like a magnifying glass for many worldwide problems. And while they are not new, they have become more visible through the pandemic. During this evening, we will discuss what this means for research and also for academia under corona conditions. And we start with the first uh, panel, which reflects on more general questions of this topic. And we have later a second panel, which will focus on the practical impacts. And there will be a time in the end of each panel to pose some questions here from the audience, but also we have a chat um, line online. And uh, please, um, I will welcome every question later. Uh, and let me now introduce our three speakers for this first round. There's in the middle uh, Gwendolyn Sasse. She's the director of the Center for East European International Studies, which is called ZEUS. And it's an interesting think tank founded actually in 2016 in Berlin. And she's also a professor of comparative politics in Oxford and a non-resident fellow at Carnegie Europe. Then we have there to my right, uh, Matthias Midel. He's a professor of cultural history and the director of the Global and European Studies Institute here at the University of Leipzig. He's also a speaker of the Collaborative Research Center, 1199, and the Leipzig Research Center Global Dynamics, and also publisher of the journal Comparative. Then we have here Stefan Rodewald. He's a Swiss historian and professor of Eastern and Southeastern European history at the University of Leipzig. 
He's speaker of a priority program of the German Research Foundation, DFG, which is called Transotomanica. You will tell us a little bit more later, which involves actually 10 universities and research institutions. And um, as I said, we have a more general discussion here, and I would be very much interested what you think, and I start perhaps with Gwendoline, um, to ask you, what do you think, which are the main challenges um, actually for academics and for you and your research work now with uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, there are quite a few challenges, um, and I'm glad we have the opportunity to, to discuss this a bit. I think it'll all keep us busy for, for a long time to come. Um, there are challenges at different levels, and there's the challenges um, for ongoing research um, that uh, was put in place um, before COVID happened and still has, is still legitimate and needs to go on and uh, cannot very often go on if it in involves empirical data collection in various places in the world. Um, our second discussion, I think, this evening will focus more on that, but that's a, that's a very serious um, challenge and it refers to the whole range of um, uh, scientific data collection. Um, surveys aren't possible in the same way as before. Qualitative interviews are not possible in the way they, they were done before. Anthropological work on the ground is difficult or impossible right now. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also a challenge. It makes us, um, in a good way, it makes us um, think of uh, or question again uh, what methods we use, in what settings, um, what questions we can incorporate now into ongoing research. And then, of course, there's also big questions um, that this pandemic makes us um, ask now. Um, and uh, in addition to all the other challenges around um, uh, balancing life and work, and if you say challenges, then that in includes those, those issues um, as well. Can you make it a little bit more concrete? For yeah. example, for your institute, was a new question occurring now? Or? Yes, um, uh, I think some questions are um, new or are being asked again. So I think if we start at a fairly conceptual level, then I think now is the time to, to really consider terms and concepts like um, the state, the nation, state-society relations. All of this, exactly as you said, we're looking through um, this lens now, a magnifying glass. And while maybe early on um, many people said, researchers and policymakers, nothing will be the same again, I'm not sure about that, but it certainly um, uh, puts other things in perspective, opens up like also a lens onto uh, processes we don't um, observe quite like that um, in, in normal times, if we, if we can say it like that. So I think at some level it's, it's really the very basic question social science research deals with, the so basic concepts, if we think about what does the global mean, this, this couldn't be more global, this pandemic, but at the same time uh, responses have been very national and local, at least initially, and that also has had an effect on societal expectations and what you expect your state to do or maybe your locality, your local government to do. So those are not new questions, but we have to ask them again. And we're, we're seeing, I think, um, underlying trends being uh, reinforced and strengthened. And we can, we can also, with social science um, research, we can capture them now. And that's really the task and the, and the challenge at hand. Mm -hmm. Matthias, would you agree? I mean, you're very much involved in two big global questions. And um, what, what do you think? I mean, we, we fought bitterly. Uh, until last year against the idea that there is one globalization that is a homogeneous process and that you can build theories about that uh, very easily. Uh, I would call that even an ideology of globalization and a certain type of globalization that was understood by that term. Um, and we proposed uh, already a little bit against the uh, river um, that there are different approaches to global connectedness. This uh, Leibniz campus is another way of uh, addressing that issue. <clears throat> but it was hard to, to fight it through. Uh, the majority of social science definitions and, and politicians talk about globalization. And all of a sudden we realized that obviously countries, societies, states have very different approaches. The ones retire from WHO, uh, the others insist on a global alliance for vaccination, etc. Um, and at the same time, uh, this uh, story uh, with COVID-19 uh, was very illuminating. I would like to illustrate that with an example. 
Think of the masks. Masks used in hospitals were pieces of two, three cents value produced in China until last year. Late March, uh, it was a very rare uh, object and in the uh, supermarket around the corner in my part of Leipzig, it was at 12 euros. So I asked my daughter to produce it at home. Um, and then there was a more general debate emerging out of this experience about resilience. We should bring production back home or at least to shorten value chains. No longer value chains to China, but bring it, let's say, to Eastern Europe. Then we have more control, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, economists surprised us with the message that this is a process happening since 2010. Nothing new. Shortening value chains and production chains is something that happened already for 10 years, being not remarked by anyone in the public debate. It needed the COVID-19 experience that we talk about what kind of model would we like to continue uh, in the case of masks, etc. I'm not sure if we all are willing to pay the current two to six euros per mask in the future, or if we go back to Chinese production uh, because it is so much cheaper. But we have a choice. There are alternatives. There are political decisions within the ways you globalize your own society, or you interact with other societies and their ways to globalize. And Let's which, say Eastern which role Europe. does oh. research play there? I mean, can it consult governments, or what, what is it doing actually there? At, uh, you know, it's an there, interesting there, example, actually. Yeah, yeah but there, there was a debate uh, in the 1990s uh, that we enter a phase of science 2.0. And that good old Max Weber idea that science is a separate field in society from politics, from journalism, etc., would be over. I don't think so. I guess we learn again that politics depend on independent research, and independent means also that we formulate our questions and that others formulate their questions, and then we can uh, start a dialogue. But we shouldn't only do research because someone asked the question in the political realm. Because many of these issues, let's say value chains, uh, are long-term processes. Politics are much short, uh, shorter oriented. Yeah? So I guess we have learned, and the virologists have learned that the first way, when we follow here, uh, that you need independent research uh, and should not mix up uh, with journalism uh, and political advice as if you are the politician yourself. Stefan, what does it mean for the work you do? You are a historian, and I think this uh, interesting priority program, uh, you, you should tell us a little bit about it, uh, trans Ottomanica. It's actually, from what I understood, starting from the 16th century and leading until today. And, um, no, I, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. No, 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 <laughs> this was <is> affirmative. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I would be interested, I mean, how much does it have to do, I mean, such a big historic program with what we are discussing now? Well, it would, I would introduce with this um, opportunity then uh, um, a little bit of a smaller focus, um, a spatial configuration, including Eastern Europe and the Near East um, in global context. And of course, there are questions today we can ask about this, but as a historian, we like to start in the 15th century or earlier. And at least we have reached now the 20th century in the second phase and until the middle of the 20th century. Just um, we are following mobility dynamics of uh, people, knowledge and objects um, between Russia and the Ottoman Empire, Persia, Poland, Lithuania and the successor states until the middle of the 20th century. Um, it's about um, the, constitu the, the constituents of societies by these movements. Um, our thesis is that societies are um, formed by migration, even if a, a, a small part migrates, the whole of society is changed to a migration society, and not only in the local or in peer um, in, this, in the meaning of uh, within the Russian Empire, but in the whole space between the Near East and Russia. 
um, for example, slave trade involved hundreds of thousands or millions of people from Poland, Ukraine, um, Russia, which were moved over centuries to the Mamluk state, to Persia, and then to the Ottoman Empire. Um, these are structures, these are um, consolidating societies. Um, what does it mean then connected to questions we are interested in in this discussion? Well, one could introduce to the plague, um, which um, then shows that our focus area uh, had a function as a hinge between other areas in a global sense, the Indian Ocean world and Western Europe, or then um, the Americas. Um, to some degree, uh, COVID-19 moved in this direction from China, um, there were large numbers of cases in Iran first and then in Italy and Germany somehow simultaneously. It's difficult to see the links, but these are the known cases. It would be probably an overstretch to see here um, our focus area in an important role. And another approach could be that we ask, um, and you were asked about this, what's changed the virus or what exacerbates it, the virus, which crises were changed by the virus. And if you look at political systems in the, in the focus area in the Near East and Eastern Europe, and could say that the systems reacted um, as they are used to react to, to crises. Military regimes did what they, what they are used to do. Um, Egypt quite successfully reacted um, to some degree. Uh, instable regimes uh, or the situations in the Lebanon uh, with other factors are now near to the collapse. Um, it's, it's a very um, abstract way to approach the question, but if one then continues with, with Syria, um, hospitals were destroyed in the, during this period with the help of, Russian, uh, um, of the Russian army to some degree. In Belarus, um, there was an election campaign going on and uh, the acting president uh, um, explicitly didn't think the virus is important and su um, supported the victory celebrations in May. Um, some, to some degree, the result of the election or the dispute about his presidency, of course, was exacerbated by this um, situ virus situation. Um, um, in Russia, the um, government reacted more proactive to the virus and there were some measures. Nevertheless, Navalny in April, May started a campaign to boost um, social support. He had, he had a five-point program published and not all of his um, pub publicity, but to some degree, um, uh, um, to some amount, the, uh, his publicity was changed also by the virus. Mm -hmm. So this is one, just one attempt to, to name some examples. Yes. Thank you very much. I think Gwendolyn Stefan showed very well that there were a lot of crises triggered actually in the time now of Corona. And I remember very well that in the beginning uh, when actually we, we heard about the first events in China, uh, there was an interesting discussion about which kind of system could manage COVID-19 better. And there was this thesis saying that uh, uh, authoritarian state could do much better than democracy. And I think we have since then seen a very different development. And I would like to ask you how you, how you see this thesis, because you're working very much mm -hmm. on questions like this. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. It's one of these big questions that we um, can think of how, how are authoritarian or democratic or also in between um, systems reacting to the crisis and how do they come out of it strengthened or weakened? Um, and initially, um, I was actually quite surprised that also in Europe you heard this thesis a lot or this hypothesis that authoritarian states or systems can manage better because they, I suppose is the implication, um, because they, they have control mechanisms in place and they can um, uh, very quickly uh, sort of control situations through um, the executive. Um, uh, but actually what we've seen, and I think that was actually as logical from the beginning to think, yes, they have control mechanisms at hand. But it's also a risk that authoritarian leaders cannot really calculate and manage, and therefore it's actually highly risky for them. And we've seen the example 
in, in Belarus, if you make the completely wrong call, you actually, um, it's not the only reason, but you stir up societal discontent, and in particular among um, also workers in the health sector, for example. So there was a local kind of organizations, health organization, and obviously anger building from below. We've seen it in Russia as well, Putin trying to delegate authority to the regions and governors and localities without the resources, but the responsibility is there. And that, that's an open question. It's not really, um, doesn't, didn't look for a long time like a strategy to really show that the, that the state is managing very well. It was rather like, can we offload responsibility and make it not so visible? So I think these are a lot, those are a lot of examples um, uh, that show that this is highly risky. And some authoritarian leaders have actually opened up and, and also accepted expertise, scientific expertise, no, noticing this, this risk. Um, on the other hand, democratic systems um, also had to use their executives in, in ways that they don't normally use them, and power got concentrated, and, and we're having this discussion in Germany, which is in Europe, one of the countries, or maybe the country that has generated the most colorful, shall we say, protest movement against uh, restrictions and so on, So it's, it's in, and against um, uh, sort of civil liberties that are temporarily um, restricted. So I think we've seen discussions, but we've also seen in democratic systems, even if that happens, and some parts of society are now vocal um, against um, uh, a temporary at least concentration of power and, and implementation of, of control to some extent. We also see uh, these what we as social scientists call rally around the flag effects. So we see uh, gravitation towards the center of politics, at least in the initial stages. Now it seems that also populism is, is can, feeds off the crisis and the fears that have been stirred up. But initially the effect was also uh, going back to what one knows best, sort of mainstream politics and the center and trust actually in institutions and some democratic systems. But maybe if I can add to that, I think, um, because you asked what are also um, issues that are maybe fresh on our agenda now, and I know that historians have looked at this for, for much longer than social scientists, but for social scientists, I think now a real challenge is to, to take emotions and, and factors like fear, like um, also uh, psychological predispositions, um, uh, seriously, and, and emotions are really something that during a pandemic comes up a lot, and that's really high card to um, factor that into research. So what that requires immediately is that I need to team up with a psychologist to then enter, for example, as I've tried now in research on Ukraine, to enter questions into surveys that might tap into this. And what we already find is actually we don't see the rally around the flag of effect. We actually see a less trust, for example, in this case, in, in the Ukrainian president. If you have these types of um, experiments, sociological experiments, that prime people on certain psychological dispositions. And I think that is one of these examples where it makes us realize some factors that, that seemed maybe unnecessary to take into account when you discuss um, trust or capacity of states, but now it's, it's really at the forefront and we really need to think of ways of also pooling expertise, different disciplines, and, and rethink our methodological toolbox as well. Mm -hmm. I think it has been already a trend for several years that we have more interdisciplinary uh, cooperation, but, but do you think, Matthias, that this time is also a time where we have actually more need for that? Because we saw with the, with the virus as well, there were different um, academics actually consulting. I mean, from nature, science, but then there was a discussion in Germany, I mean, that there should be other people from social, social science much more involved. So do you think it's really a time to, to, to work more in, a, in, in teams like this? It seems that you raised two questions. Is it necessary? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it happening? No. Um, yep. yeah, Tell us you, about you it. just mm -hmm. uh, mentioned, I mean, I, I remember 1932, uh, Georges Lefebvre, La Grandeur, uh, as the book about how the French Revolution emerged. Emotions are really not at the agenda for the first time, and I guess also mm -hmm. not in social sciences. Mm -hmm. um, but we're so, still not very good at actually. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, but I'm only, say, I'm yeah. only yeah. saying yeah, interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on reading each other's work. Um, and uh, I see a tendency, sorry if I uh, sound cynical, that people read only their own work. Um, and, and that makes it really difficult um, to speak about in this narrative. I mean, only to, to, to question, where does us lead this very central question of authoritarian versus democratic states to? Um, what do we gain when only democracies will gain or win the, the war against the virus? 
and the authoritarian states are full of viruses. Uh, so, uh, Perhaps they change, who knows? I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, but the, the, the question, of, of course, then we have an authoritarian COVID-19, uh, and that will be a horrible thing. Uh, no, my, my point is, um, do we support a game that is, of course, played by the political class um, to uh, distinguish uh, systems and, and types of system in order uh, to transform performance uh, into soft power. Um, and is that helpful um, in order to create a coalition for uh, general vaccination or to collect money uh, to create the trust that is necessary, obviously, to believe in any result of medical research, etc. Uh, so th that's only one remark. Um, I, I, I understand that this is a very central debate in political science uh, to distinguish these types of regimes. But um, I ask myself, is it the time to insist on that point so much? Interdisciplinarity, I guess, is today much more of a challenge between what uh, in the life sciences and in the social sciences uh, or humanities uh, is going on. Yeah. So. This belief in truth uh, in, in large parts of the natural and life sciences, uh, in contrast to our permanent doubt uh, that we have not yet the right answer because we are part of the construction process of that truth, that conflicts. And the political class is, of course, much keener uh, to believe in someone who tells them the truth. When we come with our results, this is social interaction that may work in that or that direction. They feel a little bit stressed. Um, yeah? And uh, here it is not only about our willingness in the realm of, of, of research to interact, but it is a question of how do we speak to the public. Um, and that is not very interdisciplinary, it seems to me. Uh, so I would say yes and no at the same time. Sorry for I think you wanted to add. I just wanted to come back on one point. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, and I'm a political scientist. And political scientists, not me, but generally are obsessed with classifying um, systems. Uh, but I, I think th you what need I was to speak louder. What I, what I uh, tried to say was that actually this shows us now that, uh, as I think you are implying, um, it's, it misses a lot of the nuance that actually what's much more I mean, interesting, if that's the right word from a researcher's point of view, is that we see similarities in, in both um, systems in terms of responding, not responding. We see kind of shades yeah. of this and it's no longer, it, ha it shouldn't have been anyway about really rather rigid categories. And I mean, they, they're not necessarily always rigid also not in existing research, but, but now we see, I think, exactly kind of um, where, where some of the limits of, of, mm -hmm. of these very rigid classifications are and how systems can behave. Also societies expect similar yeah. things in very different contexts. And if I can add one other sort of um, little remark to what you say and uh, like more, maybe more the optimistic view on interdisciplinarity. And I'm in a, in a research institute, I'm trying to help build it, um, and, and the goal is to become more interdisciplinary, which, as you know, is, is a really difficult thing. And universities are not structured in a way that, are, that, is, that anything would be conducive to interdisciplinary mm. way. Academic careers are not usually made on, unless you're maybe a natural scientist of a particular kind. Mm -hmm. Then you're very popular, I think, for interdisciplinary work. It's not made on your career on interdisciplinary work. But I think at the moment, I mean, there are actually conditions in place, which I think also we as researchers need to now fill because actually uh, natural scientists clearly have, um, have, have been leading and have been more visible. But I think this is the time when society at large is much more aware of and, and much more than we could have ever achieved of how uh, research works no? and how mm. frustrating it is as well because it doesn't generate uh, a clear answer. And then you're going back to the drawing board and you start again. But what is also becoming obvious is that, that um, historians, uh, social scientists are also needed to now fill in what is happening with society in, in these situations. So I think that it's, it's, it's really the onus is upon us now to also step up and try and make these links. The whole, the whole structure of research is not conducive to it, but I think this moment is in that sense uh, quite a special one and, and there's, there's some potential at least to, 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 to try this. Stefan, would you agree? I mean, um, I think there's, there are several appro approaches um, um, and several aspects. One the common topic is, is trust into the answers of, if by political systems. I think this is a common problem in West and East, if, it's, if we can't talk about West and East. Um, 
all these systems have the same trouble to to sell their answers as, as uh, making sense and as being reliant on science and nevertheless constitutional. And this is a very complicated situation to, to um, find solutions and to sell them in a constitutional legal way. Um, you can name Italy as an example where they are, the, you have these decrees now being used, but there are questions about the um, about the legal procedures of the uh, publicity, uh, they, these, these de decrees should have been communicated to the parliament within 48 hours or so if you are following, following the procedures. So in principle, all these political systems are at their, at their limits and um, they are not breaking down, but if trust is evaporating, um, then uh, we are in a very interdisciplinary situation. Um, um, as a historian, I'm, I, it's not, it has not been my, my job to, to, to counsel, to, to give advice to um, governments, and I, I think it, I, I wouldn't be I, uh, I'm pushing such a role. Um, but I think that that's a very difficult situation. I think historians are not educated to, to be active in such a way of trying to influence a political procedure. That, that this has not been our job in the last 20, 20 years at least. And if it has been in the 19th century or in the beginning of the 20th centuries, century, it has been disastrous in effect. So there are reasons not to do it. But historians um, seem often much more willing to comment on any contemporary event, much more so than social scientists. So, um. As soon as we are inventing nations, the troubles are starting. I would like to invite you for questions, please, um, because <laughs> there's still a little time, yes. Please um, tell us where you are, who you are. Do we have a mic? Yeah. I found this discussion. Does it work? I Perhaps you just say who you are. Ah, Gabriele Freifer from the German Association for East European Studies in Berlin. I, I and the mic. I found this uh, discussion about interdisciplinary work very interesting. That has just started. And I think Corona, COVID 19, of course, is a very good example for the need of interdisciplinary work. Um, other examples would be climate change. I think if we really want to talk about climate change and um, how to, to cope with it, we also need, of course, uh, the collaboration of people, of scientists and scholars from other fields. So uh, what do you think, um, what does it need? What does it need to support this interdisciplinary um, work? Is it first of, all, first of all that scholars have to rethink about their own agenda and about their methods? Or is it rather politics and uh, grants that are given that play an important role? Where do you see the most important factors for supporting more interdisciplinary research? Perhaps we collect another question if there's one. Yes. Mm. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. I'm Leila Rehbiashvili, working at EFL. I just wanted to link up as the, as the climate change was uh, mentioned, I was just thinking if you've been thinking about the fact that uh, Corona might indeed be the first test case in mm. responding major global crisis. And whether there is already research on the way that would have this kind of future looking perspective in terms of, and indeed beyond authoritarian um, versus democratic states, that would be looking into what kind of systems can handle this global scale um, major displacing crisis. And whether we could look at corona from, from this perspective that more crises are on our doors. Mm. Would there be a third one, perhaps, a third question? Otherwise, we, yeah, we cannot, perhaps you can answer. Who wants to start? <laughs> You are the optimist about interdisciplinarity. Oh, okay, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, I should have said it the way Gwendolyn has said it. Uh, that's much better. But you are on our advisory board, so I'm just learning. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. no, you made it easy for me to put this forward. Um, 
Uh, well, I think that's always the key question. What does it need more of? I think it needs all of what you mentioned. Um, but I think the key thing um, I would emphasize is that uh, there needs to, well, we need means and places to create structures within which this is possible. No? So I think it's not so difficult to um, make individual scholars realize that there are, um, first of all, limits to their own approaches and methods, but also interesting things from someone else and some other discipline. But to, and to integrate that into uh, projects that are feasible, supported, and that will also take, um, probably, I would assume, longer, um, because one has to learn a lot more along the way. Um, so that is all not so conducive, as I mentioned before, for an individual's academic career. So at the moment, it seems to me that interdisciplinarity you can afford if you, if you are an established academic, and then you can dabble in interdisciplinarity in a way. But it shouldn't really be like that. No? So I think it needs, so that's why I would, I think, put the emphasis on creating structures within this is actually possible and valued and um, given the, the time and space it needs. Um, but it, it needs all the other aspects too and it also starts with individuals and not everybody will even be interested in, in um, engaging in, in, in someone else's methods or I'm just trying to understand them, not even engaging in them. Matthias, do you want to answer the question about the climate as a because we're in the test phase for climate change? Yeah, I mean, the, the, this is the one uh, issue where I find this crisis so interesting. We don't know how the world order of the future will look like. But uh, what we can conclude from the very few months we have gone through is that obviously regionalism um, has a point. So when you look into the action of the African Union, uh, they were the first to uh, give up national sovereignty's uh, priority in order to face uh, the, the challenge. Uh, because they were very much aware that individual states have not the means to fight that uh, pandemic. And they were also very conscious uh, about the fact that there are many other crises at the same time. So HIV and, and so on and so on. Uh, the European Union took a little bit longer um, to uh, overcome uh, its border uh, closing uh, tendencies, but in the end, uh, everyone understood that this crisis is too big for individual national economies, uh, etc., etc. We don't know uh, if and how the European Union will act in the future. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, Trump seems to have understood that as well um, by now spreading his uh, arms into Latin America again. Something we know from 1823 Monroe Doctrine and then from the many, many interactions between the Americas in the uh, 1950s and, and so on. Yeah, so the famous fruit company and, and all this. Uh, if this is all nice and... and uh, to celebrate is, is a completely different question. So that, that's one. Second, it seems that multilateralism, uh, rule-based multilateralism, is in a deep crisis. Uh, the question is, what are the conclusions out of that sentence? Uh, particularly for a country like Germany that uh, bases its uh, ideological uh, behavior in, in international relations very much on that uh, principle, but seems to lose a little bit partners for that action. So uh, the, the, what, what comes then next? Some American scholars speculate about two powers uh, directing the world, others see three. Uh, some would say no, perhaps we have G20, etc. So, so we have a very chaotic situation when we only look into political organizations. Let's take now the transnational uh, companies and so on and so on and so on. Um, I guess that will be the task for the next four to ten years um, to elaborate on our new experience of the world order that is just emerging. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then the question of interdisciplinarity is how to apply that to fields that are seen from the natural science and the life science in a very universalistic ways. So their idea about climate change is uh, to uh, attack this problem uh, with worldwide action. And how these two insights fit together. The world becomes fragmented, chaotic, um, full of short-term alliances, 
And then someone who says we have to act as humanity uh, in a very coherent way. And here you could do something with interdisciplinarity. And I would say the condition to answer that question is it should be a shame not to have read uh, what your colleagues have written. Thank you. I think we have a last question here and I would like to ask Stefan to answer it. Where is the mic? I mean... Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Judith Pallo, University of Oxford and the University of Helsinki. Uh, I'm asking a question from the standpoint of uh, what we uh, study or what our brief is in the uh, British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies. All of you have been talking very much at a global level in responses to this global pandemic. My question is, uh, do you think that the pandemic and COVID and the responses um, are going to have an impact or likely to have an impact on how we understand Russian and East European and Eurasian area studies? Uh, or are you saying that, okay, uh, the coherence that there might have been, and I know that this is arguable, in uh, <coughs> Russian, Eurasian and East European studies up to this point has been, um, you know, smashed and torn apart by, by COVID. It really is resetting um, the agenda. I think that connecting several questions or brings it to the point of the, the reason of this gathering again. Um, you, well, there were se several other epidemics. There were SARS, there was Ebola, and these were Southeastern, uh, South Asian, Chinese, or then African phenomena. Actually, now it's the first time that Europe, after HIV, and West, the Western world, if you like this, including Eastern Europe, Russia, is involved in a global um, pandemic. And, and for example, the discussion about the culture of wearing masks was denounced at the beginning in, in, in Germany and Central Europe as being something which is impossible for our culture because of the Renaissance, etc. We, we, we are not able to wear masks. There were such articles in the newspapers. This is now part of the past again already. Um, in, how does it fit to your question? Um, well, it's just um, six months ago that it started, and uh, how will it look in, 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 t in two years? Is it, is it then um, again evaporated? Um, if, it, if, it's if it has a lasting effect, then one could try to see if some um, modes of answering troubles from from other um, from the from the second half of the 20th century or from the 1990s um, can be found in these political systems in the Russian political system or in the yellow Russian in the Ukrainian and the Polish or the Hungarian political system uh, but we should pro probably of course we should of course um, uh, be, uh, not see, seeing it in a container of Eastern Europe, this would be disastrous. Again, of course, it's a globalized situation. And everybody, every system has the ability to react in an other way, and uh, these systems are interconnected. So, um, even without, of course, without this situation, uh, we we have been starting to talk on a global level, and we should, we will continue to do this. Um, uh, this is, I think, no question. Um, so the, the answer will be probably, no, it doesn't change so much um, after all. And the situation is a global situation, and um, you have in every continent uh, um, several modes of answering. You have, uh, and it doesn't make sense to, to see these answers as leading to structures which will be persistent for the next 20 years. I'm very doubtful of this. I think in two or in five years, there, there will not be an Eastern European structure having evolved, and not a Central Eastern European, and not a Eastern or Eastern European in the, in the smaller sense. I think the, um, it will be difficult to, to map the world on the grounds of COVID-19, if not impossible, no, yeah, rather impossible. 
Ah, you want to add? Okay, but then we I, have to come to the yeah, end. I know, it's a big question. It's a wonderful question to think about. Um, I mean, I think uh, we had moved um, quite far from thinking of that vast region as one. Um, but I think nevertheless, and I think that's what your question was getting at, I don't think that's going to change. And we know that there's so much variation within that region. And, and we see that today in the response to COVID as well. But I think nevertheless, um, there will be also new similarities emerging between parts of, or uh, maybe um, parts of countries uh, look, will look more similar again within a certain region than they might have for the last um, sort of two decades. And in particular, if we think of what's happening to the economies in, in the whole area. So uh, we've talked more about the political system and, and how strong the state is and, and, and those things so far. But if we think of that, and it rolls back a lot of the development on small and media, medium-sized enterprises, for example, so the challenges, um, uh, very different systems across the region will now share in a way how to uh, rebuild this and not, not having the res reserves to support the system like many, many West European countries um, do, I think raises interesting questions then, again, from an academic point of view, that, that we might also see more similarities again than we have seen for the last maybe two decades. Matthias, um, your, your question reminded me of a joke I learned at school. Uh, the Elbe dries out. What happened? The <laughs> Chinese People's Army fills its water tanks. Uh, meaning, uh, we are a very, very small part of this Eurasian landmass. And when we turn into climate change and all the research about resilience, uh, our society's resilience, we become aware again that this Eastern Europe is not only about political regimes and about uh, energy supply, etc., but it is also about an enormous landmass with all its challenges when it, for example, will defreeze. Yeah, what will happen to our cities uh, when the tundra is no longer uh, this hold of, of CO2? Uh, so I guess this kind of research can be inspired by this turn into the question of, uh, about resilience of societies. Here I would be more optimistic uh, that this will remain. Uh, yeah, there is now debate about how to build smart cities when it is uh, coming up with, with uh, more heat. Uh, we speak about where to do our vacation uh, when all these places are so burning. Um, and na, 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 na. So it is very close to our, to our life experience. And, and there I would say society will ask us for answers. And perhaps also the Eastern Europeans. Yeah, thank you very much. We came to our, the end of this first round, and I think we see already that it's, this event is like an appetizer for the <laughs> conference because uh, the huge questions which we can really just tackle a little bit, but not really go into the dip. dip. And we have a, a second round, now 15 minutes pause, and then we have more practical impacts which will be discussed. So thank you very much, and see you later. So ladies and gentlemen, after a small pause, we go on with the more practical impacts of uh, COVID-19 pandemic on research and academic work and uh, I'm very happy that we have again very competent and nice uh, <laughs> speakers here at the panel and I will introduce you to them. Um, it's Gabriele Freitag in the middle. She's the managing director of the German Association for Eastern European Studies DGO in Berlin and the DGO is the largest network of academics in Germany engaged in research on East European affairs, and it has a very well-respected journal called Osteuropa, Eastern Europe. And Gabi is as well the General Secretary of the International Council for Central and East European Studies. Uh, then we have here to my right Judy, uh, Judith Pallet. She is Emeritus Professor of Geography in Oxford, an active member of the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies and also on the editorial board of Eurasian Geography. And she has a research project. She will tell us about it, very interesting. It's actually launched at the Helsinki University. It's on prison administration in Russia. Then uh, here to my, next to me, it's uh, Reka Krishmenac. Uh, she is defending her PhD in uh, comparative history next month, and she comes originally from Hungary. She did her master there in nationalism studies at the Central European University in Budapest, which had to 
change its place to, to Vienna, as we all know. And currently she is a lecturer at the University of Leipzig and also a teaching fellow for the Global History Lab at Princeton University in the US. And she will also tell us about her experience. And I will start with Gabi, because I remember very well myself that I think it was in March that I went to a big uh, uh, conference in Hamburg, which was actually the annual conference of the DGU. A very interesting topic, and we were already keeping a little bit distant because of COVID-19, but it was still uh, actually there. And uh, I remember it so well because it was my last conference for, for a long, long time. And, uh, and I could imagine that you felt into a deep hole or something afterwards because it was actually quite quickly that you couldn't do any traveling anymore or conferences or how, how was it actually? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is I can't even say that COVID-19 came as a shock to us because I think it took us several weeks to realize to what extent our work would change. Uh, since in the beginning we just delayed some of our conferences or workshops or panel discussions, uh, thinking that we would organize them within two months or three months. So uh, we then at a board meeting um, finally decided that for the whole year we would not do any real events as we did before, but rather if so then hybrid events like the one that we have here today. So it, it took us some time to learn what it means. And, but what is interesting, I mean, we of course were not the only ones. And now looking back at the last months, last five, six months, I really can see quite well the, the pros and cons, the, also the advantages of uh, what we have been coping with. Which are the advantages, so, actually? Um, if, so DGO mainly is a network. What we do is uh, organize communication of scholars from various disciplines. Uh, but our focus, and I think this is different, our work in this respect is different to the work of BASIS, because we also work at the interface between academia and the general public, which means we also reach out to people from politics, economy, media, um, NGOs, uh, whose work is related to Eastern Europe as well. So we organize academic discussions, but uh, we also organize the exchange between academia and other spheres. And uh, so we do organize a lot of events. And um, there has been a lot of talk on Belarus right now. And I think so Belarus might serve as a good example. Um, we were able to organize a um, four-part series of discussions very quickly after the protest started. So uh, for separate events, inviting people also from Belarus, from Russia, from Finland. And of course, they could all join us because all events were online, Zoom. Also, we could reach out in a way to a broader public because most of our events are Berlin-based uh, since we have our office in Berlin. So we get a lot of positive feedback uh, from our members and also from other people who say it's so nice. Uh, I do live in Frankfurt, I do live in Zurich, and now I have the opportunity to join your events. So we invited people who otherwise would not have been able from Belarus to, to, to come to Berlin right now. Um, and we reached out to a broader audience. And this, I think, really is an advantage. And this is something that we should work on further, I think. But especially if we take Belarus, uh, people do attend these discussions, not only to get information. A lot of them are really involved. So what is lacking now is to have a platform where people really can discuss where can they also exchange their emotions? There has been talk about emotions, and I think emotions are very important, also in the sphere of academia. So I think there is a certain need for people to discuss what is going on in Belarus, and, uh, and also maybe to discuss 
what can we do about it? And this is something that I really feel is lacking at the moment. Mm -hmm. So here you have the pros and cons, um, taking yeah. Belarus as an example, and how we cover what's going on there now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rika, I would like to go on with you. you. I mean, you were perhaps lucky that you finished your dissertation already, I mean, in this time, and now you still have to defend it, but you, uh, uh, as a lecturer, I could imagine that you really had hard times, because that's what I hear from my own children studying and people around, how difficult it is actually to lecture now, uh, and especially with people who start university. Could, could you share your experiences with that? With us. Um, yes, I also think that would lead us very far if I'd go on, you know, about the general challenges of postgrads. Um, so just sticking uh, to the to the teaching uh, in COVID circumstances. First of all, I would really make a distinction between the management of online transition in a setting where there is no tradition, no methodological preparation for it which happened to most of the European universities uh, with COVID. And there was also an already growing but still marginal sector where uh, online learning was already something in development for the sole purpose of being delivered online uh, to an audience. So um, obviously a lot of improvisation and a lot of flexibility was needed from lecturers who needed to do the transition from the offline setting to the online setting with a bit of an exaggeration overnight. Um, but I think that we already have in all different academic settings now at least one semester of good practices behind us. And this is really something that, that, need to be, that needs to be treated strategically. So this should not stay in those staff meetings that were held every second week, exchanging experiences. There should be a very systematic reflection on this experience. And I think also a dialogue needs to be opened towards the online teaching systems. And I'm, and I'm both talking about those scholars who are working on the methodology of online teaching and the technical uh, departments, because, it, because I think that uh, technical literacy alone would not solve the issue of those teachers who are used to the on-site teaching environment. So well, there's some simple lessons, I mean, where you would say there are differences. I mean, with people, as from what I understood in this project you're in from Princeton, you're actually in an online project which has been designed like this. And, yes. and on the other hand, you see in Leipzig that you need to be a lecturer under some improvised conditions. So, so are, are there actually some, some, I don't know, lessons you, you, you could tell us already? Um, yes, uh, and then I would uh, also have a question mm -hmm. uh, at the end. So uh, I think that maybe the, the crucial issue is attention span and being aware of how different attention spans towards different communications of content can be. So uh, I did have a very short training before I started my uh, fellowship, uh, um, headed by Princeton University, but this is, this is a, a network, uh, really, um, where uh, we could see how the different kinds of contents, audiovisual content, uh, textual content, and face-to-face -face, uh, content are measuring up in relation to each other, how they are following each other in a, in a very easily perceptible way. So how they are actually trying to manage just very tiny things. Uh, I think uh, one of the immediate techniques that came into mind transitioning from the uh, uh, on-site teaching to online teaching was to have simply Zoom meetings or using whatever platform for having an online seminar. This happened uh, very often. So um, simply breaking down uh, these sessions into, into shorter sessions or uh, making sure that smaller groups of students have the 
possibility to discuss some things, for example, in, in so-called breakout rooms, so that we are creating smaller spaces of discussion where the lecturer is always jumping in, checking in whether meaningful work is going on there. Uh, could be much more efficient than, let's say, trying to deliver a lecture real time to an audience of 20 students real time. So this is this is mm -hmm. maybe this is maybe uh, something. Or it was also a very um, frequent response, I think, that professors recorded their lectures so that uh, they wanted to make sure that, uh, regardless of internet connection issues and simply how different people were able to manage the COVID situation. They want to make their content available, the most important, the core issues available in a single lecture. We could, we could say that, sure, uh, if one uh, wants to dedicate a given amount of time to listen to, 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 uh, to, that, to that specific lecture, then they can sort of break up the lectures in a way they want to. But um, this is really usually not what, what is happening, but it's more like, scrolling and, and speeding up uh, the, the lecture and then parts of our are, miss, uh, are, are going to be missing. And of course there is like no foolproof way to prevent this. But for example, if the, if the, the lecturer uh, very consciously uh, composes the lecture in a way that it is meaningful to break it up into smaller segments and it is also uploaded in smaller segments, usually the turnout is, is, is much better uh, at, at the end. Mm -hmm. So these would be the very sort of specific. Thank you. Would it be okay that I take Judith first and you, your question will be later? Or? Uh, maybe later, yes. Yeah? Okay, fine. <laughs> so Judith, um, the European Research Council has provided a grant of nearly 2.5 million euro from what I saw for your project on Russian prisons and it's also for five years and uh, so I would be interesting what what does the corona uh, pandemic mean for a project like this which lives on empirical empirical um, research I mean you need people to go into prisons so so, so what are you doing now um. Yes, I, I, I would want to preface what I'm saying um, uh, by sort of observing what, you know, the gasp from the audience um, uh, conveyed, which is that there aren't many um, grants in Russian and East European area studies of this size. Yeah. So whatever I'm saying um, about the, the difficulties that COVID has uh, created for my research are um, certainly mitigated by both the time of, of, the, of the research I have five years, and you know, I'm only in the second year of it, uh, and the resources that I can deploy to um, uh, you know, get myself out of the difficult or get us out of the difficult situation that COVID's put us in. But in talking about that, I would want to be underlying just how difficult it is for those people who mm. haven't got that time and haven't got those resources. Because uh, you know, a lot of my um, the, the reconfiguration I've done of the, the research and the sort of um, alternative ways of collecting data that I've been able to uh, use depend on the size of the grant and the time um, I have to, um, to do it. So to, so to get to your question, so just to, to preface what I'm saying uh, with, with that, the way it's, uh, you know, my research is, is a, a difficult area. It's, you know, interviews with vulnerable subjects in closed institutions. And so one of the obvious things that happened immediately uh, in, uh, with, with COVID was that those carefully negotiated over a period of, over, of a year access to Georgian prisons to interviews, mm. to do interviews and uh, Romanian prisons to do interviews, um, plus um, uh, you know, the uh, subcontracts are um, uh, negotiated with, with Russian researchers to do interviews with former prisoners, because we can't get into Russian prisons mm -hmm. at the moment, just collapsed. That all became absolutely impossible. Uh, and so I had to find an alternative, um, you know, series of ways of collecting data. But again, one thing I would say is that, that this in research is a fairly common problem because effectively what's happened is that I've lost access to the field. I'm not the first researcher doing uh, sort of uh, postdoctoral and, and further research or doctoral research who's lost access to the field. It's a fairly common problem 
and especially in the global south and especially in uh, Russian and East European studies or Soviet and East mm. European studies. So it's something that people in our area should be used to um, and uh, should already, I think, when they're putting together grants and putting together projects, grant applications and projects, should always have fallback positions and should always think, what am I going to do if I don't get permission to go and do this, that or the other, or if I don't get... Um, uh, sort of access to this archive because this is a common feature that goes right back to when I started back in the 1970s, mm. you know. Um, so I have to say within my grant I'd already built in lots of fallback, fallback positions. Um, so what do I do? Instead of uh, interviewing prisoners, I'll interview former prisoners uh, because I don't think we'll get back into prisons. You know, no prison is going to want any outside uh, researcher going in and um, seeing how they dealt with COVID, which on the whole they didn't do, deal, deal very well and lots of human rights violations. So, um, so we, we switched in that way and we switched countries, Estonia. <laughs> Everything's going to be generalised from Estonia now because from Finland you can get to Estonia. Um, and, uh, you know, I came just come back from um, interviewing uh, former prisoners in Estonia. I've been able to use my resources to contract, subcontract onshore researchers to do my interviews for me and so on and so forth. So the there are all these things that I'm able to do, but that you're not able to do, <laughs> I think, unless because you haven't got the resources. Uh, which you you is spoke about a genera uh, generation gap, actually, before. Yes, we yeah. had a little round. So, so yes. would, would that something be something you, you would Well, anybody it, of or? my generation, of one or two who are perhaps approaching it, um, well, anybody who remembers back to 1989, 1991, no doubt will have been struck by some of the similarities, mm. you know, suddenly, and it really was overnight. Um, the, you know, people's research was, uh, you know, especially those, those poor souls who had just finished their book on the stability of the Soviet political system, <laughs> and we all know some of them, and some of them never recovered from it. You know, this, this is rather similar mm. to that. Um, not, not in quite the same way, but I'm just thinking you're very lucky that you're, you've just finished your thesis. The people, I, you know, the, the, the graduates, the postgraduates I feel very sorry for, and the early research, uh, early career researchers, is those who have done, you know, who are halfway through their field work. You know, what can they do? Mm -hmm. Can they get the resources from their funder, their university, to... Um, you know, employ other people to do the, uh, their research for them, it's, it's, it's not so easy. So then what you have to do is start thinking, well, of alternative ways of doing interviews, and that's when you get into um, uh, Skype, Zoom, and there have been a lot of discussions uh, amongst the anthropologists and sociologists about how doing a Skype or a Zoom interview is nearly as good as doing a face-to-face -face interview. You know, and there'll be whole papers devoted to that. Uh, but uh, as you know, that this actually raises a whole series of different methodological and ethical mm -hmm. questions that people, I think, haven't even begun to think seriously about in Russian and East European area studies. Um, and especially if they're doing the sort of, the sort of research that I do with vulnerable subjects, how do you ensure confidentiality how can you ensure confidentiality when you're using Zoom or Skype? Because we do not know what access third parties have, have mm. to, uh, to these. So, so, you know, my advice would be to, uh, to people who are saying, OK, instead of going and interviewing people in person, face to face, I'll do it on Skype or Zoom or by telephone, is, hey, hang on a minute, stop. You've got to think about the ethics of this. If you've already got ethical approval for... Um, a project that's doing face-to-face -face, uh, interviews uh, from your university, you must go back to your university ethics committee and reapply for using this different methodology. You know, there, there are some very, very serious implications. And that's before we get on to the um, general data protection regulations, <laughs> uh, which um, uh, concern the um, movement of data both you, if it's within the EU, fine, not too bad. If it's from a non-EU country mm. into the EU, you know, this is, this is a very, very tricky area 
that uh, you know, COVID and the, the lack of access to the field in the way that we might have been expecting to get access to the field has, has changed and that, that one's got to rethink about. So sorry to say, uh, sound gloomy about it. There are, you know, there are ways of doing it, but you know, I would caution just going into alternative methods of data collection without thinking very seriously about the ethical and logistical problems of it. I'm yeah. sorry, I did answer your question. I didn't think no, I did. No, no, that's I? fine. That's <laughs> fine. But um, Gabi, I would like to focus a little bit more about this question of young academics because mm -hmm. the DGO has also a lot of programs actually for young people and networking and so on. And so, are there some things you 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 were thinking about what what there is to be done mm -hmm. to help um, young academics, especially now and. Are you lobbying perhaps somewhere to get mm -hmm. longer term, I don't know, scholarships or whatever? I mean, no, the thing is, we, we dis interestingly enough, we discussed uh, the, this question this morning because uh, we have a section for young scholars called Junge DGO, Young DGO. So we had an organizational meeting and of course via Zoom this morning where we mainly discussed organizational questions. So in the end, I said I would attend this discussion tonight. And so I asked them, what do they think? And do they think that we have um, for different generations of yeah. academics different experiences now? So what they said on the one hand is that uh, they feel that of course um, elder scholars are more hesitant with using online tools. This is one thing. So that you have, as you already said, it is important in a way to already have some experience in using online tools. So this is one problem. And I suppose in Germany, um, this goes for nearly all people who teach at universities that there is hardly any knowledge. But on the other hand, they also said um, that it requires a lot of self-organization. So if you take really young students, uh, it takes a lot for them to uh, to do this online teaching. I mean, to to be to be in a class, to be in an online class, because it really re requires that you organize your work very independently. And this is another problem mm. that they see. And then, of course, but this is something we might talk about later on. Uh, it is also the danger that since. COVID-19 and using online tools also has a lot of advantages that we might face the problem of our governments now thinking that this is a good chance of economizing and which also might mean that there will be less, I don't know, that might mean that uh, there might be less money for education and for teaching and this also might have an influence on jobs for young scholars. Mm -hmm. But this is maybe something we can talk about later on. Mm -hmm. Rika, what, what do you uh, think about yes, this? Yes, I, I, uh, at some point uh, I also um, hoped that this is going to come up because I think that the pushback against onlineization uh, is completely understandable from, from this point of view. And I don't think that it that in these terms there would be a sort of a generational divide where young scholars would be like mm -hmm. flocking under the banners of having more online and then mm -hmm. from, uh, from the uh, senior faculty there would be a pushback. No, I, I, I think it's, these fears are, are really well established and the US is a very good example in, in many ways that online teaching in a way can take away jobs uh, mm -hmm. in higher education. And those uh, departments, uh, I can only uh, speak for the, for the US context, so those departments which are really hardly hit by, I mean, which, which are really, really um, uh, heavily hit by it are, are usually the otherwise shrinking arts and humanities departments and liberal <laughs> colleges um, so anyway. So also Eastern Europe studies or? Um, Including these, I mean, the, the, the very um, specific uh, examples I am aware of are more general sort of big humanities departments where, where you would have maybe a philologist who is specialized in one, in the, uh, in one of the Slavic languages. And then uh, if, if the department goes, then the given person uh, also also um, needs to go. And also there would be a, a broader implication of is a professor and their human 
and intellectual capacity is replaceable. And I think this would again bring us back to these broader ethical questions that are just about to emerge or, or re-emerge uh, and which, which really need to, to be seriously thought about. I mean, I, I do hope that there's an obvious answer for this question, but, but we, we do have to have solid arguments for it and be able, for example, to defend it against such governmental intentions mm -hmm. if they do exist already. But still in Germany, I mean, most of the universities are state funded. I mean, we have private universities and my feeling is that they have much more problems now with COVID-19 especially if they have a lot of foreign students who are not willing to pay anymore if they can't enter the country. So tell us about Great Britain. Uh, from what I read, I mean, there's this double effect of Brexit and, uh, and COVID-19, so. I'd much rather not, I prefer <laughs> not to talk about what's going on in the UK at the moment. No, but, but, but in the uh, university, uh, in the <laughs> academic, I mean. Well, yeah. uh, would um, it's all bad do? Um, uh, I mean, I, no, no, of course, I, I, you know, what's, what's happening? I think it's part of these, these universal trends, but it's just exaggerated. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be with, with Brexit, because already um, uh, before COVID, we were worrying about, um, you know, the, the, the movement of, of scholars at all different levels uh, into the UK. And COVID has just, uh, you know, made that, made that even, even worse. So I don't see anything good. But I would really like to bring the discussion, if possible, back to mm -hmm. uh, Russian and East European um, mm. uh, area studies, because, and it goes back to the same question I was asking earlier, is there anything particularly mm. that is affecting us? And I, th I think that the answer to that is very much yes, because one of the things about area studies is that we tend to study other places from the ones we're in. Now, it's less like that now than it was during the era of Soviet and East European studies, when it was people from the West going to, to uh, Eastern Europe and to the Soviet Union and um, trying to do their, their research there. But there's still this idea within area studies that, that we're interested in place. We're interested in how place has affected, has a bearing on you know, what we're interested in examining at the present time. And so to have, not to have access to place is terribly important in, in I think, uh, area studies and in, in what we're all engaged in, uh, 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 in both in teaching and in research. And so I think we have, uh, you know, potentially this is very, very damaging and all of those possible consequences that would be, you know, the lack of, of funding um, by our universities to to go and look at other places, be in other places, do our research in in other places, which has obviously has affected um, all disciplines, but I think us in in particular, and of course where the uh, you know language is really important. I don't know mm -hmm. um, whether this is the case in Germany, but you know uh, if you're going to study Russian, you have to speak Russian. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to study uh, Czechia, you better speak speak Czech and one of the good ways of doing that is actually going to those countries and not to be able to it cannot be substituted by um, by this being done online and so and I, I think that's really what has, has brought home it, this COVID has brought home to us is you know when we find that we can't go to the area in which we're studying even if we can get all the data online even if the archives are now all being digitized actually I must admit this is one of my um, discussions I have with historians. I cannot understand how historians can study an area sitting in an archive and not need to go there. But this is a particular thing I find <laughs> difficult to understand about historians, as well as the way they draw their maps, which is in their books. So those are the two things. But, you know, I think, I think this is really important, and, it, and, and that is what I think for us is, is the issue, is uh, sort of so, but may I ask, since area studies are very often under pressure, do you see a chance or a danger in it? I mean, the danger might be, okay, we can do, so from the outside academia, let's say, because even within the academic field, you see that area studies are very often under pressure and to, to, um, to explain why they are important and why it needs people to go to the places. Uh, so do you see that the current situation is rather a danger with people thinking, well, 
as long as you have Zoom uh, and can at least discuss via, discuss online with mm. people, you don't really have to go there? Or do you see on the other side that there is a chance for area studies now to show that it is really important to be on the spot? I think this goes back to um, which institution we're having that conversation with. So it was something that was said in the, in the earlier session, is that the, the way universities are um, constructed and the disciplines are, um, uh, the historical disciplines exist in universities, um, is, you know, inhibits interdisciplinarity, which is, you know, area studies is interdisciplinary, if nothing, if nothing else. Um, uh, so there's an argument that's going on with universities, which is different from what um, uh, governments are asking for and what the research councils are asking for. Because I, I don't know, it's certainly the case uh, in the UK funding councils, and it's, it's also the case with the ERC, that the two boxes you have to tick and you have to show are that you know you are interdisciplinary and uh, what's the other one? Well, yes, sort of area studies, inter, international you know, intercultural, yet the problem is that that doesn't translate into universities. So the answer to your question is, I would want to know to whom am I, am mm -hmm. I, uh, I am mm -hmm. trying to make that case. Is there an opportunity? I'm going, to be uh, um, uh, I'm going to be very optimistic here and say, yes, if we're prepared to grasp it and come forward and make that case and um, argue about the importance of, of place, of engagement with the cultures we're, we're, we're examining, um, and that this is of, of vital, vital importance. Of course it is, and, but you know, we've got to be prepared. I think you know, area studies can come forward and, and argue that. Having said that, you know, the attempt certainly that I've been engaged in um, when I was uh, before Matthias Tukova's president of, of BASIS, uh, with various of the, for example, Humanities Funding Council, uh, or the Social Studies uh, uh, Funding Councils in the UK, to um, try to impress upon them the importance of language, of social scientists, historians, uh, people who aren't in modern language departments, um, acquiring foreign languages, um, uh, you know, sort of falls on deaf ears. Um, you know, something you have to learn Russian in evening school. Rika, you, do you want to add to this discussion something? Um, I think uh, I, I would, uh, I could quite neatly tie my earlier question into this and, and, and this would be really a, a big uh, open, uh, open mm. question. So what do, what do you think? Um, after COVID or after there seems to be a moment when the world is coming up for air. Is there going to be a kind of a systemic reaction and incorporation of this COVID experience into how funds are being, or fund applications are being evaluated? For example, is it going to be a requirement that in risk management, everyone includes who might want to involve fieldwork that health risks, pandemics, what, what would be the, the answer for hmm. that? So, so just to go to the, to the very very practical level of things, well, or uh, yeah. with, with the faculties, those faculties which don't have this tradition of online teaching, will they actually have contingency plans which will build on something like a series of trainings that tries to make scholars literate in online tools, even though they might be able to deliver the lectures on yes. site? Perhaps well, you both could answer um, but but not so long because we have yes, also yes. questions from the chat and yes. from the audience. Yeah. I think what <laughs> well the quick answer to that question is actually going back to what I said at the beginning. Nobody should be putting in an application for research funding without uh, certainly in our area, po possibly not in East Central European uh, countries now. Although I can think of a couple where it's advisable. But certainly if you're doing research in Russia or or Central Asia or one of those, you should always have had. Um, fallback positions. You always had to, if you want to get the grant, um, you know, shown uh, that this can genuinely be be done. I mean, what I, I was, as I was saying earlier, I've, I've been amazed at one of the recent mm. sets of 
applications for a position I was looking at from some young scholars where they uh, were, um, uh, you know, their research projects were to do um, field work in Bulgaria or, or whatever with these or that subject, as if COVID hadn't happened, you know. The other, I think that our, our work is going to change and I think that it is going to be, it would be inadvisable, I think, at the moment to um, say I'm going to do research in such and such an area over the next couple of years. I think we're going to rely more, which is good and positive, on, and it goes back to what we were saying before, and I hope that they get the funds for it, for, for the onshore, for the people coming from those cultures. But that is raising lots of interesting questions about um, uh, research by the sort of indigenous researchers and outsiders. Area studies has tended and, you know, historically to be the outside view. But I do think that, you know, a lot of the research now um, that, that will have to be supported is, is going to be by people who are in those countries and, and the higher education institutions in those countries. And I think that's a good thing. Gabby, you want mm -hmm. to add? No, there was nothing no? to add from my side, but it's a very interesting thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Because we, we have an interesting question actually from the chat, um, and I will read it to you. Uh, how much will COVID-19 affect research with regard to giving priority to COVID-19 topics, ignoring other research topics? Mega, do you want to answer this? or um, uh, do, you, do you have the feeling that there is like a fashion of COVID-19 topics now? I think maybe this could be easier, uh, could be answered uh, easier by a natural scientist or, or okay. life scientist, but uh, as we already um, um, uh, heard it in the in the first panel, obviously there are very severe uh, implications for the social sciences as well as for on COVID or onto COVID as, as, a, as an experience basically. So on the, on the short term, I think most of the big grants really require years of preparation. So by the time these sort of very um, complicated applications would be put together, they, we, we might, uh, you know, would see the after COVID period. But I mean, I, I, I would not really venture into, into guesses exactly because I think none of us could safely bet on whether this pandemic or this sense of impending doom is going to stay with us, at least in the midterm, or not. Do, do you agree? I, I, I'm, I'm not no. sure that I, I, I agree with you. I think it's okay. already had an impact, okay. and I think it's bound to I, um, uh, on, uh, on the research funding councils. Um, you know, because especially, you know, as one has to, uh, uh, so much research now is, uh, is about answering the problems, the immediate mm. problems of the day. I can't see how that's, uh, there's not going to be some but I think the question I, may, was I must admit everybody I'm talking problem, to, I say put in, put in COVID, mm. yeah. add some COVID in there. Mm. Um, mm. I, think it, I think that it needs wise grant giving at this. Yeah. So because of course there are certain criteria that will have to be taken into account and I suppose there will be quite a lot of research on, on effects of COVID. Uh, but of course, the danger would be if you give too much money to to COVID projects now and disregard other topics. Yeah. So I think what what would rather be important is I think what Gwendolyn already mentioned in the first panel is that there are certain criteria that you will have to integrate into research questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe criteria that come up with regard to COVID. Mm -hmm. I would like to take some questions here from the yeah, please. Yes, and then Only one uh, remark, uh, there was uh, a call for applications by Volkswagen. Uh, Do we need COVID the mic actually? Yeah. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 uh, issues in the social science and humanities, 1,100 applications. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it is end of September uh, that there is the uh, German Research Council um, waiting for another thousands of applications in a special program on COVID-19. I would say there is a certain opportunism to turn everything into COVID-19-like uh, stories. Mm -hmm. But my question is, is a different one. I can't confirm this end of fieldwork story. Um, in our university here in Leipzig, uh, the rector has to authorize each travel to a foreign country. Um, and you have always to argue in favor of 
the young researcher applying for such a thing. And I write my fingers uh, bloody uh, in, <laughs> in uh, writing letters that this fieldwork is necessary and the people travel like hell. Um, meaning... You mean uh, at the uh, moment. Uh, to, to turn it into a question, uh, what is the, the narrative? Is the narrative uh, we had a sharp interruption of any opportunity to do fieldwork, but we recover soon? Because we have established over the last 20 years a standard that without fieldwork, um, there is no valid uh, research any longer in transnational, transregional, global, whatever it is, yeah, social sciences, history, or so. Or do we fall back into a hundred years tradition to do armchairs research? Because that is much easier to do, less costly, um, and the books, you know are read as the others are. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, uh, for which story do we decide? And, and I hear Gabi's uh, argument, which I read very, very mm -hmm. often by German professors. There is the danger. Uh, they will cut resources. This government will cut resources. Uh, or do we describe the danger until politics take mm -hmm. the message mm -hmm. that there is no fieldwork necessary? So I would ask back, whose standard is it that it requires field work to do good research? Uh, we, Isn't we, it the standard of people who are engaged in, uh, in um, area studies? When, whenever you uh, look for applications for jobs, recruitments now in uh, what kind of history, you can't get anyone uh, who has no experience with languages, field work, and uh, archival work, not only at home, so metropolis studies also. And you think it would be the same with uh, social it sciences? Part of social sciences is the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Judy, what do you think? I'm not sure what the question was, actually. But what's the narrative? Uh, oh, what's the, what's yeah. the narrative? Or is it a trend back to the good old practice without field <laughs> well, it was a good old practice that I was just wondering about. If you were doing, in your early years, all that sitting in the armchair, you could jolly well have read my books. Um, but that's, that's a different point. Um, what's the narrative? I'm not really sure what the narrative is yet, but the narrative might be that, yes, that is up for discussion. I was thinking specifically within Russian and East European area studies, where fieldwork has really been so very important. And I think the narrative there is that actually some of the research that has been, been funded for people like myself to go in and look at the Russian prison ser service really should be funded for Russian people to look at the Russian prison service, um, if only they would take an interest in it. Uh, um, so I, th I think the narrative in area studies is rather different from the, you know, uh, m might end up being rather different from, from, um, from that narrative. Um, maybe the armchairs should be left for the people towards the end of their careers, you know, and, and the young ones. But no, I mean, if you're saying, and I, I think I would agree with you, that there's been, a, a you know, a, there has been among uh, you know, with young researchers, perhaps, you know, more international travel and things that are called field work than might be absolutely necessary given the research topics they're doing. So sometimes, you know, uh, when you're talking with, with young, I'm thinking more sort of master's students uh, talking about their topics, they're driven by wanting to go to a particular place um, rather than what is the intriguing uh, intellectual question that I want to in investigate, which might keep me um, here. But I do have to say, as a sort of potential supervisor, my heart would always sink when somebody came along saying they wanted to look at office development in Leicester, compared with somebody who said that they wanted to go to you know, Africa. But, uh, uh, but there, are, there are lots of other sort of questions. I think there are lots of question marks over field work from Western academic institutions that began long before COVID, which are to do with the colonial 
gays, you know, sort of... Um, I think that's a discussion on its own. And that's it a different discussion, <laughs> yes. But, but I think a... that there's, the narrative is up for debate and COVID might have, uh, have indeed, um, uh, you know, pushed it up the agenda. There was another question which I would take like a like last question. Related to uh, Matthias' question from uh, just uh, now, it, it was uh, rather into the, the direction of methodological skills because you were uh, talking so much about uh, the, va the value uh, of contingency plans and uh, the value of uh, being able to switch in case of necessity, yes. but still it's, uh, it's not the same. So you, you won't uh, ask the same questions and you won't get yeah. the same results. And uh, you would also well, perhaps even lose the skills of doing things in terms of participant observation, in terms of interviews. And uh, isn't there uh, basically this, uh, if it were to last, uh, kind of a danger of uh, basically losing mm. the, um, well, the, the ability, losing the methodological capacities, uh, relying on those, well, very laudable contingency plans that are around? They're not, but, but I, again, I go back to this is what every good researcher should always be doing anyway. And yes, of course, you're absolutely right that it, it often involves, you know, having to develop new skills, develop, you know, um, you know change the methodology that, that, you, were, that you were planning uh, to use. Um, but that's what happens in somebody's research career. You know, it's, it, that is... That is what research is about, is to be able to respond to, uh, to changes as they occur. And that is something that people should be prepared to do. I want to give you an example of an, a thesis I examined recently by somebody who um, wanted to do some research in a, in a, a male institution, happened to be a prison in male institutions, was not given permission to do that, you know, this is what I was saying, loss of access to the field, not being able to do what you wanted to do, common in, in research, especially in our area. So this person did it in an all-female institution instead, um, but hadn't, hadn't read anything about um, gender. You know, you have to do that. Or you say, well, I'm not going to do research. I mean, I just think it's part... You, you know, you, you then have to shift and you have to have to learn a new, a new method. But really, giant shifts aren't, you know, um, actually they are in the case of the, US, uh, as the USSR. We used to do this very frequently. And the other thing you know, you'd say was, choose your research topic sensibly when you're setting out at the beginning, is don't be so sort of over ambitious. Actually be prepared to work within the then parameters. You know. But that hasn't really answered your question. Other people might disagree <laughs> with me. But it's, and before and it might, we might come say. to the end, do you, do you think as well, you both, that we lose abilities or also, are there also chances now to learn something which we could actually use when, even when COVID-19 is gone? I, mean. I think the question implied that there could be gains and it's more about the losses, if I, if I understood it correctly, concern about the losses. Mm -hmm. and yeah, but I, but I also think that, that you did also acknowledge it, that yes, losses might occur on the way. And it's terribly scary because a lot of investment, for example, into learning a language, it can, it can get stale. We do, we do know what happens with a language skill that is not being practiced enough. But this can happen to using specific methodologies as well. I think that's, that's a real issue. I mean, one example, in, a historical example, because we've not talked about access to archives, which is very important. A lot of stuff has been digitised, but a lot of archives haven't been. But if you think of people like Steve Barnes, he did his wonderful book um, on the Gulag in Carlag. Everybody at the time thought all the regional archives were going to open up. We were going to be all be able to do that Gulag research. Of course, they closed down. He can't get back into Carlag. And so somebody like Paul Wilson Bell, who was expecting to get into the Novosibirsk archive uh, for, for his PhD work, couldn't get there. So he had to shift and look for different sources and use those sources in different ways. You know, that is, you know, I think if, you, um, if you're not prepared to make those shifts, you should, you know, do your thesis on office development in Leicester. <laughs>
Gabi, perhaps the last sentence, which yes, is also... Well, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think, I suppose that we will not go back to business as usual. I think that COVID really will affect uh, academic um, academic research, also communication, etc. And I think the most important thing is to realize that we at least have the ability to shape the way to a certain extent. Yeah. So we are not just victims who are now affected by, by COVID-19. So I think it is our job now to see where are the dangers, where are the chances, and that we should really take the chances that there are. Yeah. I think that's a very nice closing remark for this session. And I think we're also in the middle ourselves of an experiment, because if I think some month ago we thought it wouldn't be possible to sit like this, to have discussions like this, a hybrid format. And I think we're learning with the developments to cope and to live in this new normal. And I'm very optimistic that we will meet again here in April, <laughs> uh, having a kind of conference, whatever this will be, I mean, in, in terms of hybrid format. And um, uh, it's planned to be from the 21st to the 24th of April uh, next year. And I hope to see you then again. And thank you very much uh, to you, to my speakers, especially to the technicians there, to the organizers and um, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.